Welcome to the Lounge Lizards podcast. It's so good to have you here. It's a leisure and lifestyle podcast founded on our love of premium cigars, as well as whiskey, travel, food, work, and whatever else we feel like getting into. My name is Gizmo. Tonight, I'm joined by Rooster, Senator, Pagoda, and Bam Bam. And our plan is to smoke a cigar, drink some Armagnac, talk about life, and of course, have some laughs. So take this as your 90-second official invitation to join us and become a card-carrying lounge lizard. Plan to meet us here once a week. We're going to smoke a Cuban cigar tonight, share our thoughts on it, and give you our formal lizard rating. We journey into a new type of spirit tonight. We debate the merits of Cuban regional and limited editions, and we discuss Chinese and Russian relations with Cuba, all among a variety of other things for the next 90 minutes. So sit back, get your favorite drink, light up a cigar, and enjoy as we pair D'Artigalong Boss Armagnac VSOP with the Juan Lopez Selección Number 2. A Robusto tonight from Cuba on the pod. It's the Juan Lopez Selección Number 2. It's a beautiful cigar. Yeah. Bam love Bam this, love this has cigar. been sniffing the foot for quite some time now. The wrapper's Unbelievable. delicious. Unbelievable. Yeah. It smells so good. Mm. So Looks really nice. JL1, JL2 are like brother and sister. Yes. For me. Yeah, that's the only two remaining from the classic line. Um, and then they added another cigar recently, which we could talk about in a little bit. But um, yeah, it's just it's really just the JL1 and the JL2 it's as far as regular production stuff from them, which is sad. But kind of a story that we keep going back to every time we do one of these like tertiary, you know, non-global brands. It's It's an ignored marca that has been cut down to only a few cigars. You know, it's well, unfortunate. Only, only two. Only two. I have the unpopular opinion in the room. I'm not that sad. <laughs> no, we know. <laughs> we, we know. know. <laughs> All right, boys, let's cut this thing. See, we're getting on the cold draw on the wrapper. Rooster and I love this cigar. I do. And I the love, JL1 even more. I love more. the one, love yeah. the two. So this is a classic Robusto size. A little shorter, I think. Actually, it's 50 ring gauge by four and seven eighths inches. 2018. 2018 box from Rooster tonight. It's mm. a five-year-old cigar. Beautiful. It's probably the youngest box rooster has in his tower. That's true. <laughs> wow, that cold draw nice. is incredible. Mm-hmm. That is special. Mm. Yeah, I get a little hint of dried fruit. It tastes like a. Well, I've called this out. I don't remember what cigar. It's like a fig Newton. Yeah, it kind of tastes like a like a doughy. I think that's spot on. Figgy type thing, You're right? Spot yeah. on. Wow. A mm. mm. little bit of wood, a little bit of coffee, but. Mm-hmm. Mainly uh, mainly the fig. All right, let's light this thing, boys. The Juan Lopez Selección, number two. In Cuba, again, it's a Robusto. It's 50 ring gauge by four and seven eighths inches. One of the two remaining cigars from their classic line in regular production, and they have a third in LCDH release, which I believe comes in a fancy box of 25 cigars. It's called the Selección Especial, it's a mm. double Robusto, 52 ring gauge by uh, six and three quarters, which is a pretty big cigar. Yeah. But it's one of those things where, to me, it's like, I don't know, it's the same tobacco leaves, different blend, but you're paying for that packaging, you know? So back in time, did they have more Vitolas? They did, Bam. Uh, they actually canceled quite a few. I can go through them. It's a travesty, actually, you know? Oh. As the smoke is billowing off this, it smells great. Yeah, I gotta say, it's actually very good it's on good. the light. Yeah, yeah. It took a while to light this. Right I don't know if it's it like did. densely packed or what, but surprise. I it's actually funny as I was looking at the box. So Rooster brought a uh, twenty-five cab uh, of these tonight, and uh, as I was looking at the box, uh, they seemed more densely packed in the foot than I would expect from like a D four or a RAS or an Epi two. Uh, but the the draw is perfect it is it is so i think there might be a little bit more tobacco in there but they're rolled well so you, you know there's still room for the air to go you get that beautiful pungent flavor profile in the light just so good the aroma coming out of the foot it's ridiculous oh, it's incredible oh. this is a really nice cigar i've never had draw issues on a jl cigar same. ever ever same yeah never ever very consistent i've had some draw issues on the jl1 which is a corona gorda which is the same size very similar to the uh mag 46 and i think it's just the nature of that smaller ring gauge longer cigar they pack a lot in there and i've had some draw issues on selection what do you ones. like the cigar when it's like wide open no i okay, like resistance I, yeah, I like a little but bit i don't want to fight it yeah i don't need yeah, an hour long fight. just a little resistance yeah. though not not agreed. a lot yeah agreed so what are you guys getting on this so far you know a tiny bit of barnyard pungent it's like an earthy earthy like soil like almost 
Not Petrichor. Yeah, like, <laughs> no, no, but kind of like like earthy tobacco. Mm. Um, I get the same earthy notes. Yeah. It's funny. I wish there was more fig. Yeah. You know, it, I wish there was more fig Newton on the light. It dissipates, right? I don't yeah, know. It's, yeah. It's it's not really there. Uh, like it oh, was in the in the cold draw. Smell the foot line, the the yeah, burn line. The burn line smells amazing. You get a little fruity note there, I think. Yeah, yeah it's weird. The burn line smells very different than mm. it tastes. Yeah, it's the strange. I, I, they're a little disconnected. Yeah, yeah. Which I like. The, what you're tasting, the flavor is like very earth driven, but the the nose it smells like fruity and even a little floral. Yeah. I shouldn't even say this because when I smelled the foot, I don't know how I get like I got a little bit of the cocoa milk chocolate kind of a smell. So I was expecting something completely different, and it's now I'm finding it like slightly peppery, which is totally off. So I'm like, I that don't know, the, something's off with that my was palate. the yuhu that you had for lunch today. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Remember yuhu? <laughs> Do they still make that? Yeah, is that still around? It's in a glass have, bottle, right? Yeah. I, I used to have the quick, I think. <laughs> Nestle quick. <laughs> Nestle quick, yeah. I loved yuhu. Really? When I was a kid. Oh, I lived on it. Really? Get on a bike, go to the corner deli. To you, who's please? <laughs> <laughs> Every weekend. So we mentioned again, this is alongside two other cigars in regular production right now. Uh, the selection number one, which we did on episode 15 many, many moons ago, is the Corona Gorda 50, uh, 46, excuse me, by five and, uh, and five eighths inches. This one is the selection number two, the Robusto. And they also have the Selection Especial. Uh, which is a, they call it a Fortunas. That's the factory name. It's a double Robusto, 52 ring gauge by six and three quarters. To answer your question, Bam, um, they canceled, I you know, must have been six to eight different regular production cigars that were all handmade. Uh, most recently, they canceled the Petite Corona, which I kind of wish they still had. Yeah. Because I like this flavor profile Me of the too. Petite Corona. They canceled that a little, uh, like nine years ago in 2014. They canceled the Corona and a small Panatella. Uh, in 2006 and oh a, interesting wow. another petite corona which i understand why they did that in 2002 but you know the brand has an interesting history i didn't know how long this brand had existed it was founded in 1870 by juan lopez diaz uh, in havana and what's interesting is for how long this brand has lived and and has been around and has been successful mm -hmm. there's really not a ton of interesting history about it wow. other than the time mm. Uh, it was, like I said, founded in 1870. He died in 1900. Uh, the brand was sold to an independent cigar company called Cosme del Peso y Silla, uh, and they owned the company until the revolution. Obviously, we know what happened then, but it was one of the top-selling brands until the 1980s. How interesting. Specifically, the late 1980s. Uh, I think that's probably when Cohiba, Partagas, some of the other brands really took hold, Yep. and, and this, this brand was kind of pushed down. You know, catalog is just so full of so many different markers. You have to expect some, you know, dissipation. Some cuts. And, yeah. Yeah. So what's interesting is to to chase, uh, you know, maybe Cohiba, especially with the success of the Robusto in the late 80s, early 90s, the Selection number one and number two were both released in the early 1990s. So this is a cigar that really hasn't been around terribly long. Right. Uh, and then that was all they had for quite quite a bit of time. Yeah, honestly, the you can't go wrong with a JL one or two, at any time. I've never had a draw issue. Quality was fantastic. The burn line can be uneven from time to time on both cigars. I noticed that on every vintage, on yeah. every yeah, yeah. But something I, with the blend, something about it, I just enjoy it. Just yeah, enjoy these two cigars more the one than the two. For you me, like the one more for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. And with a little bit of, but uh, not a little bit, but <laughs> maybe like not a for you. Bit of age, ten, eight to ten years of age. Oh, on sure. The <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> oh, just, God. Just for the listener, that's a little bit of age. I'm just saying. Yeah. But I will say that is the reason I made the comment when we started. I'm, I'm maybe the outlier in the group. The only thing that frustrates me with Juan Lopez is I remember Rooster gave me my first one that was young. And I really didn't enjoy it. And then we reviewed one with some age, the JL1, and that was dramatically, dramatically better. So for me, it just is a little frustrating that even the JL1 we had with age, it was very good. But to me, it's not like a top, top tier cigar. So I don't have the patience to wait because I don't think it could ever compete with like an age D4 or an age RAS or something like that. So that's... um that's kind of what's hard for me with this. You know, similar to the Epi 2, though, which right now I think is on a really good run. They're like the really recent stuff. Yeah. 
I have two some, years and younger. Yeah, and I exactly. I have some JL ones that I think for being twenty twenty one, late twenty maybe they are. Um, they're smoking brilliantly. Mm-hmm. I would argue better than the aged one we had on the podcast, probably on episode fifteen. Yeah, I, I don't, don't remember how old that was, but I think yeah. it was nineteen. Four years old, maybe? Yeah, I just finished off a box of 19s. I have yeah. one left, actually. I Every cigar, I just savored. And it's a good alternative. If I want if I don't want a D4 or a RAS. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good like, offshoot. Honestly, it is. Same it's, for me with the JL1. Yeah. If I'm not wanting a Magnum 46, if yeah, I if I want to change the profile yeah, yeah, a little yeah. bit, I'll go to the JL1. Oh, totally, dude. You know, because it's the same size, same, same kind of smoke time. Yep. A little different experience. Yeah. So these only come in two different kinds of packaging. Both cigars, the one and the two, come in slide lid boxes of 25 cigars. And you don't see them a lot, but they do come in slide lid boxes of 50 cigars. Really? So it's an identical packaging situation to the Epicure Number 2 from Hoyo, only 25s and 50s. I want the 50. I know. I would like a JL1 50 50? cab. Oh, dude. Please. And they're not that crazy, like, price-wise. No, they're very... Well... I mean, for now, Habanos, relatively yeah. speaking, I mean, they've yeah. gone up, but yeah, I would say about $20, $20 a piece. Mm-hmm. It's very reasonable for this cigar. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the jail one. That was a good save, by the way. What's that? <laughs> very reasonable for this cigar. It is. It's true. <laughs> it oh, is. they're not badly priced. They're like 20 30 bucks. It's not a big deal. <laughs> mm. So, yeah, the uh, Selección Especial, which we mentioned is a La Casa del Habano release from this brand, comes in a ridiculous varnished uh, luxury Boyt Nature box, which, again, you're just paying for the packaging on that. You know, it's the same tobacco leaves. Like, I just can't get into the packaging stuff. Give me the one and two, I'm good. Yeah, exactly. So we're about a quarter of an inch in in here, boys. Anything different than on the light for you flavor-wise? I think mine's starting to settle down a little bit, even out. I'm curious what you're thinking, Senator. You don't seem uh, thrilled. Um, no, I'm not. I'm not unhappy with the smoke. It, the the thing I don't love about the flavor profile is um, how woody and earthy it is. Mm-hmm. It's a little more dominant than I would like it to be. So I've just been sipping what we're pairing with this, at, which has some sweeter notes. That's helping kind that's of true. balance this better for my palate. Very true. I I don't disagree with that. Yeah, I mean it is it is an earthy smoke. It is woody. It's yeah. earthy. Or I feel like the JL1 is a bit fruitier, um, a bit salty too, different than this guy. So you, the Woody flavors is like that's classic Juan Lopez flavor profile. That's certainly what they're going for. And I think that the people that chase these, which doesn't seem like there's many, I think it's more of a connoisseur type stick. You know, I, I, Wood is I, definitely yeah. in the I mean, I the smoke profile. between the one and the two at least like one of these like a week. Really? Or every, oh, wow. maybe like every I, other week. Yeah. Like yeah. I was reaching for a JL1 once every two weeks or so. Yeah. Yeah. Consistently. Yeah. yeah. What would you say this, would you say this is a mild cigar, medium cigar? Where would you place it? Uh, I think more on the medium side, I think. Yeah. Not mild. I agree with that. Firmly medium, right? I think medium. I don't know, but firmly, I think mild to medium. Of, mm. or, yeah. I'm kind of yeah. in between mild and medium. It's, I don't think there's much, you know, there's not a lot of oomph there. I think this would be fine in the morning. You know, with a cup of coffee. The There's, reason I say medium, I just think anything that's like earthy and woody, uh, it's hard to be, unless it's very lightly delivering those flavor notes. For me, it's hard for that to be mild. Like that's a pretty robust flavor. Like mm-hmm. in the morning, I would I would not expect. In the morning, I like something that's a little sweeter, a, a little fruitier. creamier, mm-hmm. fruitier. Right. Yeah, I agree with that. I think this is a very pleasant smoke. I love the JL2. Yeah. I, I think I prefer the JL1, but we'll see how this develops. I haven't had a lot of these. You know, I just don't reach for a lot of Robustos. And when I do, it's always D4 and RAS. That's where I'm going. That's you know? a, what? That's, <laughs> that's very <laughs> odd. I don't that's, reach that's, for that's a lot a, of Robustos. It's like how the most often? popular size. We smoke no, tons of them. How about. often do you see me pull out a Robusto? It's, it's not very you, often. You smoke RAS. RAS and D4. And D4. I, I, have, uh, I haven't uh, seen him with either in a while. Oh, I will say that. I, he by Robusto? No, I don't even, I don't even pull those No, out. I haven't you seen you with a RAS. Or or thank you, Ben. Really, I haven't. D4. I've been smoking a lot of Lanceros. I guess. You know. We all smoke a lot of Robusto. Yeah, stuff, you incl- you just well, sent us do. a Coro you smoked the other night, we like do. within the last week or two. Yeah, I want one of those. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> I do. I am dying. You guys I'm sorry. Get, get in line. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm dying for one of those. Shop is closed. Okay. 
<laughs> so what do you? Uh, what's your favorite size? Lancero for sure. Lancero, well, Lancero. Well, that's lately. That's like for no, the but last that's been year. that's last really but. It's a loaded question. I mean, Lancer, I, I really love a Corona. I mean, Mag 46, you know, smoke a lot of those. Yeah, you like Mag 46. I love Monty 2s. Mm-hmm. I love P2s. I yeah. think I think Robustos, for me, I don't reach for them as much as you guys do. I just don't, especially a Cuban. I, I, I like Robustos. I think it's a great size. I prefer Robusto over a Pyramid any day. Mm-hmm. I think, um, I I think I'm I with Rooster. With I, I, I think Robusto is my favorite size in that. It feels great in the hand, and it it slots in at almost any occasion. You can so predict. Like, you can predict the investment of time. That's yeah, the thing. It's yeah, like if it's I right actually, amount of time. Yeah, if I have a lot of time, it's satisfying. If I actually have not as much time as I'd like, I can usually smoke it fast enough that I can get in a robusto. A pyramid, I need a bit more of a time investment, so it's hard when I'm in a bit of a pinch. Um, and the same goes for a lot of other sizes. I mean, I love a Churchill, but obviously that's an investment. You really need the time for that. So I, I think Robusto is is probably my favorite, yeah. uh, favorite it's, size. It's funny because I don't think of the size, but if you really think about the cigars I smoke, they're all Robustos. It's either the D4, the RAS, the Dominicana. Even yeah, in the later, I smoke a lot of uh, yeah. Robustos. And and Padron Exclusivos. And ex- That's probably the, if, you know, I don't think of that as a, I almost think of that more as like a Corona because of the box press one up, but that's a Robusto. It is. So that's the one that I smoke a lot of. Yeah. So you do smoke a lot of Robustos. I smoke a lot of no New World Robustos. Right. But in Cubans. <laughs> Still a Robusto. <laughs> this is a Cuban episode, boys. <laughs> Listeners can disregard those comments. No, I you know, I I I I'm always going for a Lancero, a Corona Gorda, or a, a pyramid. Yep. As far as Cubans go. That's generally where I'm I being. love the aroma from this. It's great. You know, from the foot. I just love that. I mean to I really Rooster's point. That. If the if the actual flavor when you draw the cigar were what you get on the nose at the burn line, I would be really happy with this. I actually love how this smells. I just the taste is different. Honestly. But I always get the aroma out of the foot is always better to me than what I'm getting. Yeah, in my mouth. and that's your mo from every in every Since almost I've met every you, cigar. Yeah, that's been the way right? you yeah look at your cigars. I don't know if I. I but listen, I have to say something. Go ahead. Honestly, if you retrohale the cigar. You do capture what you're smelling on that foot. No doubt about it. For me. See, for me, when like I'm always you I mean, you guys always see me. I'm always you know, sniffing the burn line. Yeah. I started doing that because of you. I don't think that it I don't think that I would say most of the time, unlike what you just said, Rooster, I don't think that most of the time I prefer it. Most of the time it it enhances or it really like that's where I was going. It like true. collaborates with the draw, the flavor yeah. of the draw. I do think there's a disconnect here between the flavor of the draw mm-hmm. and the aroma at the burn yeah, line. Because just to build on that, for, for me, when, when I'm smelling the cigar at the burn line as I'm smoking it, it's usually enhancing a certain flavor note that I'm already getting mm-hmm. as I'm drawing and puffing mm-hmm. on the cigar. Where for this, what I'm smelling at the burn line and what I'm getting when I'm drawing it are just totally different. It's not enhancing the earthy, woody notes. It's like right. flavors I wish I was getting on the draw that I'm just not getting. But I will say what bridges that is the retro hail. You have to try that. I think the retro hail is really nice. It's very nice. It's but got a little pepper too. Yeah, it gets a little spicy through the nose. No, me. not for me. I'm, no? it's, for me, I like captured the fruit note in this thing. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm getting a little spice on the retro. Hmm. I like a not a white, bad spice. White pepper, like a white pepper. Black yeah, pepper. like a white yeah. pepper. Yeah. You guys are sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> so, Senator, you mentioned our pairing tonight. You were sipping it. I haven't tried it yet. Oh God, here we go. It's yeah. the uh, what's it called, Giz? You've got the bottle right in front of you. It's called the. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. I'm sorry. I can't help it. <laughs> it's called. I don't want to do this, Senator. You pronounce. Can it, we you? just get Make some? An attempt, can we get you? some American simple stuff, please? <laughs> it's called the Boss Armagnac. Armagnac. Armanac. Armanac. Boss Armanac. I, I thought the first letter was a D. Where are you it getting is. Boss? No, B A S Armanac. And the the people who make it, oh God! It's you can the do it. Dartig, dar, Dartigalong. <laughs> what? Dar, Dartigalonge? <laughs> it sounded like a dark Dartigalonge. Dick long. I'm family. not going to make this episode. Right, I just can't finish this. <laughs> You're going to have to cart me it's out. A, here. <laughs> no, <I'm> t- <laughs> 
Oh, Jesus. <laughs> it's, it's since 1838, the Dartigolongi family. <laughs> hold on. Can we, hold Tell on. me how you pronounce hold that. Let, let's see what Google says. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> hold on. Dartigolong. I wasn't ah. that far off. I added oh, one you syllable. You said longi. E. <laughs> Dartigolong. Dartigolong. Okay. They're the family that produces this for uh, going on almost 200 years. So what is this? This is an exo cognac? No, uh, an Armagnac. Yeah, it's an Armagnac. Oh, I don't even know what that is. What is an Armagnac? It's going to explain so, to you. Right? Hmm. This has been fun because obviously I was very bullish on us going down the cognac journey that we have, but I don't know anything about Armagnac. So this was fun. Bam had recommended this bottle because he tried it recently. I did. And um, I was just trying to make sure I understood kind of how these all fit in the world of um, brandies, which is essentially what is common among cognac, armagnac, and really anything like it. So um, the umbrella term for all these things, brandy. Brandy is basically any sort of fermented fruit juice is a brandy. And then if it is made in the cognac region in France, it's a cognac. Oh. If it's made in the armagnac region, then it's an armagnac. Oh, interesting. So it's the same stuff. It's just made in a different place. Yeah. Not just that. So then there are some other differences oh. too. That's kind of the first tell. Where it's made would define that, but there's also a bunch of different things that uh, influence how it's made that distinguish a cognac versus an Armagnac. So a cognac is usually made from one type of grape, and I mentioned this on one of our cognac episodes. It's this Uni Blanc white yep. grape. Mm. An Armagnac is also made with Uni Blanc, but there are three other white grapes that they traditionally make it with as well. So it's usually a blend of four different grapes, not just one. That's interesting. So that's kind of the second key distinction. The third is the aging process. So Cognac, to my surprise, is actually generally skews younger. Hmm. So I think we talked about the VS, VSOP, and XO being, I think, two, four, and maybe six or eight years. With an Armagnac, what we're drinking, which is fairly accessible in their line, it kind of starts at 10 years age. Oh, wow. 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 So that's also a big difference. And then lastly, the taste that you get in each of them, cognac is meant to be, and, and actually what corresponds as well, what's the alcohol content on there? I want to, before I say this, make sure that this holds true here. 40%. 40? 40. 40. Interesting. Okay. Wow. So that was clear as day. I could read that, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so cognac tends to be more subtle in kind of the flavor notes and especially the delivery. We all talked about how smooth cognac is. We drink 90% of them neat. Uh, Armagnac is more complex and more robust. It drinks more whiskey like yeah. um, most of the time. So just diff- different styles that bring out different things, but they're all part of the same family in that they're brandies and right. all from fermented right. fruit. I find this to be quite tasty. It's really good. Yeah, I like it. I find it interesting, too, based on what you just said, Senator, that it doesn't have a distinct age age statement. It mm-hmm. says aged more than 10 years in oak cask. Well, that's true of also all cognac. So like when the VS says theirs is a minimum two, VSOP minimum four, and even scotch we've talked about, there's kind of this misconception that everything when you buy like Macallan 12, that everything's aged 12 years. It's not. It's minimum 12 years. So that could have also been blended in with a Macallan that was aged 14, 15 years. And are, and are they doing that? Because we've talked about this with cigars, and specifically Cuban cigars, on a recent episode about how they're not changing the blend to try to match, let's say, a vintage to the previous vintage or match a D4 what it should taste like today versus what it tasted like five years ago. Right. They just The blend is the blend, the tobacco is the tobacco, the vintage is the vintage, like mm-hmm. wine. Are they doing what Scotch is doing, like McAllen here? They're trying to make it consistent. consistent. Mm. That's the thing. They're trying okay. to do the exact opposite of cigars. They're adjusting the blend slightly to try to keep its consistency. And especially with Armagnac, where it's made from four different types of grapes, I imagine year to year, if the yield is pretty shitty one year for one of those four grapes, mm-hmm. they're probably using more of some of the others and trying to blend it so that it, it reaches kind of the same flavor profile. Right Now, the only exception is with both cognac and I would say even more so Armagnac, there are vintage bottles 
that are from a specific year. Mm. Ah. And so that year is going to taste very different from another year and is not meant to be at all consistent or like this XO or something in their kind of standard line. It's an outlier. Though, yeah. Those and do years. people chase those vintage years like wine? I'm they sure. do. Okay. They do. And that's where it kind of gets fun because when you buy an XO, a VSOP, whatever the case is, you know every single time what that's going to taste like. Yeah. When you start getting to the vintages, you know, you may find three different years that you really love and they taste completely different. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cool journey, honestly. It is. So I'll be honest, I thought that the name of the spirit was Armagnac. Mm -hmm. I didn't <laughs> I didn't type. realize that that's the type yeah. of spirit. Yeah. And it's the other name. Right. The the one with the D. Don't bother. That is the family name. I didn't re I didn't even know that Armagnac was a spirit. I mean, mm -hmm. that's like we've been doing this podcast what, almost 2 years now? Yeah. I, and it's like I've never even heard there is an of Armi Armagnac ever in my life. You can take an Armagnac journey here. There's there's, there's, there's this other, is making me lot. want to do that. There's, there's a, a lot. lot. Yeah. There's even other brandies. Oh, absolutely. Colorados. Sure. Wow, right? Sure. But on to Bam's point on on Armagnac, when I was in uh, a Bottle King, a, a retailer near us to pick this up, there were a ton of different other yeah. uh, bottles of Armagnac, I had so no we, idea. we truly could. So my dad drank Armagnac a lot. Really? Yeah, and you know, I was at a I was at Lizard Charlie's house in town where I live. His son Lizard Hollis was graduating high school. They're both you know cigar aficionados, and they had a pretty decent party. So I was there. I had two glasses of bourbon. Then they served me this, and it just took me right off of my bourbon trail. Is that I when made, you started texting us? Yeah, I made a right turn, <laughs> and I followed that Armagnac trail the rest of the night. It's nice. You made a lot of right turns that night. Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up at Pagoda's house at like 2 a.m. <laughs> I woke him out of bed. <laughs> By the way, that's totally true for the listeners. It is. I, I also have to hear, so uh, this young lizard who is oh, graduating yeah, from high is, school. Lizard, not... lizard Hollis. I have to hear, you gifted him a sampler of Cuban cigars. Indeed, and I did. I would love for you to just share with the listener for a high school a high school graduate Listen, what sticks you curated. So let me I'm just, gonna pull up the photo so we make sure he doesn't miss it. I don't I won't miss a thing. <laughs> I know it verbatim. I'm good. But I, I respect this young kid. He has from I think from his early ages of like maybe eighth grade, freshman year, he wasn't smoking that early, but he was into the artisanal nature of what a cigar is. And I think by sophomore, junior year, he's really getting into cigars and having one or two with his dad, you know, after, you know, doing whatever he's doing. But every conversation I had with him at such a young age, from the point of view of cigar knowledge, is off the charts. Off the charts. So right away, I got to think to myself, this kid knows what he's talking about. He loves the cigar business, loves cigars. I want to give him a nice gift. So what, what was in the gift? Hey, what'd you give him, Bam? All right. <sighs> Now you're going to say it. Oh, all right. I have it right here. I can I know it. what it is. Actually, go back to what, what does he usually smoke? Like New World, Cubans? What, so he loves he, he loves Davidoffs. Um, oh. Not a fan of the Millennium Pyramid. Sorry. Can I just uh, yeah. just quick check again? He's in high school. He's a senior. So he's in 18. high school. He's 18 years old, yeah. and his favorite cigar is Davidoff. That's yeah. crazy. He loves he's, Davidoff. He's... He's in for a journey. Wow. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he's he, big fan of the Davidoff line. Um, I'm not sure what else he likes, but he does, he had the BBF that I gave him. He said it was incredible. So I respect that because he appreciates a really high quality cube. I got to say, and I, yeah, cause I want to get to what you gave him, Yeah, but I have to say that at 18 years old to have a palate that's appreciating that. Cause you Absolutely. know, you think about when you're a kid, your palate's really driven towards sweets. Yeah. You know, like that's, that's how kids are, right? Sure. So to have a palate that can appreciate fine cigars yep. at that age yep. i think that's that's pretty pretty advanced he's planning on starting a cigar club at, at his school where he's going to college oh they're gonna love that oh yeah oh well <laughs> <laughs> depends on where he is <laughs> that's true <laughs> he'll end up being a pariah very quickly you know no. we'll be talking about lizard hollis getting uh, <laughs> lizard expelled hollis. no 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 <laughs> so let's go through what he what 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 uh, lizard so, hollis received i started off with the cohiba exquisito oh yes yeah I the, actually thought that was a Siglo, but that's that, what that I thought small. too. Yeah. yeah. And then the Por Laranaga Petit Corona. Mm -hmm. Then from there, it went to, I believe it's a, is it a RAS? Not nope. a RAS. Hold on. Don't tell me. Oh, that's a BBF. Yep. Bellicosos uh, Finos from yep. Bolivar. Bolivar, Bellicosos Finos. Then the Up and Two, the Monty Two, and then I gave him a Fundadoras. Trinidad uh, Fundadoras. Fundadoras. I did. Wow. I wow. Did. Yeah. Wow. So, Bam, I'm going yeah. back to high school. Okay. Yeah. I, I would like one of these samplers. Yeah. I never graduated. I'm still in high school. <laughs> I never got that. Where's all of ours? 
Yes. Someday. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he will appreciate. So he he's already reported back to me about the BBF. Went through what he captured and what he liked and what he didn't like. He's an appreciative kid. Like he knows what he likes, what he doesn't like, but he captures the details of every cigar. That's impressive. I would do that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you do do that. <laughs> so here's a question I have. So um, how much experience has he had with Cuban cigars prior to you introducing him to him? He's had experience, of course, Yeah, f- through his father, but I'm not sure okay. how much. And what is he telling you about what, what he's feeling about Cubans versus Davidoffs or other new worlds? Like, what is, what is his kind of journey well, I seeming I think like? the challenge for younger cigar smokers is the accessibility to, to Cuban cigars and their, you know, their apprehension to pursue them not knowing if they're real or not, yeah. where to source them, who to talk to about it. Well, yeah. look, for all of our 18-year-old listeners, Bam Bam's your guy. <laughs> <laughs> That's a no. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's kind of true, right? I mean, if you're an 18-year-old kid, if you want to even try a Cuban cigar without buying a whole box where, where do you, you go do? you can't you, you can't. can't but you can go into a store and buy a single padron a single Davidoff, Davidoff. or any that's other right. new world that you want to try exactly right right so well that's why he's yeah. going to start at least the cigar club then they can all split up yeah they box yeah they could do what we do yeah, yeah. i guess yeah. i mean yeah. that, listen that's how we started we weren't 18 no we were you know but we all started we were splitting boxes five right. six seven ways yep and we'd try, we'd try it out, see if we liked it. And then we'd go out and all of us would go bonkers and buy boxes. I figured that sampler would kind of like give him a good profile. It is. It, it's, some a, of it, the more oh, it's a great, it's a it's great, a great profile. Yeah. I yeah. was very sense. envious. I'll be honest. Yeah. I, I would have oh. kept the fundy. <laughs> <laughs> I felt obligated. Young you man, felt obligated. young man embarking onto the wow. world. So does he listen to our pod? He does. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, He's congratulations a, to uh, Lizard Hollis. Lizard Hollis. Yes. Yeah. Yes. My man. Graduating second, number mm. one, for getting Bam to open his tower. That's true. With this incredible gift box. Not an easy thing. Not an easy thing to do. And I had a chance to experience that army neck at his, at his place, too. It's great. Yeah. Great night. So this, uh, this army neck, I'm finding, I, I love the viscosity of it on the glass. When you take a sip, like I, I you know, as we've been talking about uh, this gift box you gave, I haven't sipped. And yeah. look at the look at the the legs, it's the legs, legs on on the side of the yeah. glass here. We're drinking these out of like wine glasses. What I like about Very it, civilized. it's not overly sweet. It isn't. It's yeah. just enough. And I think th- there is a, a very slight bite, but on the, on the front. But as it finishes for me, it's very very smooth. And, very smooth. And, and I'm getting a bit of creamy honey note for me. I agree, and, and I think that it. I think that this is a wonderful spirit for a cigar. Mm. And again, I'm frustrated that I hadn't heard of Armagnac. Period. Like I'm kind of embarrassed in a way, honestly. Like not not joking. Like I don't have any idea how I've never heard mm. of this spirit before, being alongside brandy cognac and and some of those others. You right. know, right, right, quote unquote after dinner drinks. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll admit. I, I mean, I had heard of it, but it, its kind of reputation is like a a poor man's cognac, basically, and. There's so many things I think that we've discovered through this pod where it's like one thing is kind of held up as the gold standard and the other is like the ugly stepchild. And then we tried the ugly stepchild and we're like, wait a minute, that's actually really good. And that's kind of my experience with this. Like this is just as deserving as any cognac of being a premium spirit. I don't know why the world is such that like cognac is this really revered spirit and Armagnac is just an afterthought. I think this is just as good as many cognacs we've i had. agree is it something totally with, agree. is it something with the branding relating to the region in which it's produced the, yeah i mean just it, the it, cognac it, reasons kind of like it's you better know, known right yeah, yeah but the, the perfect example of this is just like champagne right yeah. like everyone thinks of you know fouve cliquot or something that they're familiar with that comes from the champagne region as being the only great sparkling and then you try sparklings from other parts of france uh grower champagnes that are not even in the champagne region and then stuff in you know the new world. You try you know some sparkling wines out in Sonoma and, and all over different places. And you you know Cava in in Spain. There's so many different sparkling varietals that you can buy, and you find some really good stuff. But everyone just kind of we're all due to marketing. Our minds are trained to think that only champagne makes the good stuff. And it's fair that there's an overwhelming amount of great stuff made in champagne, but there's also great stuff elsewhere. And I think it's very much the same with cognac and Armagnac and really any brandy where our minds are, you know, the marketers have trained us to think that only cognac is a premium brandy. 
And and I think I just from a few sips of this, I'm I'm already excited to try other RMX. Yeah, X. agreed. You know, it's similar to my feeling about the grower champagnes. When we had that, that was an for me, it was an experience I've never had. Yeah, and I've I've never even heard of that type of champagne until that evening. I found that I gave it a pretty good rating. If you remember, it was delicious. A bit more bolder, a little bit more body. Fantastic. And that's uh, I'm actually glad that you said that. A yeah. little bolder, a little more body, and that's like Armagnac and cognac. It's true. You and just said like that earlier. That's the, right. The irony too is like you think about even the process. Like I was stunned to learn that most Armagnacs start at 10 years of age, right? They're not pumping this out in the mm. same volume, right? Like cognac, the entry level is VS. That's only two years. That floods the market. You can get a zillion bottles of and VS. And so much of that is just not, not, good. not great. Palatable. Right. No. Yeah. I mean, we found one that uh, Croiset Cro uh, VS was that good. was actually yeah. very drinkable. It was, was pretty good. Yeah. But, you know, a lot of it is just like something you'd quickly have at a bar and even mix into something because it's not really great on its own. Uh, but you don't have that in Armagnac, which is very cool that like the kind of entry level to it is 10 years of age. They're not pumping this out in volume. And, and I really like that. So the one thing we have not talked about yet is what is the price on this? I was box? about yeah, to ask that. Price. It's a great question. I took so that. the reason why I asked that is I'm because. I'm guessing it's in the 70s. I, me too. I, I would think so. I'm hoping it's less. Yeah, me too. But I'm kind of getting the vibe from this. That I got with the Remy seventeen thirty eight. You know what? In that I agree with you. In the in the way it pairs with the cigar. Yeah, and a bit of the flavor notes. I think I agree. There's some similarity, maybe very this slight. Is, this is something that at the right price mm. is, for me, very interesting with the flavor of a cigar, especially a cigar like the one we're having tonight. Yeah. Cuban, a little earthy. I yep. think this would be great with a Cohiba. I love the pairing. I think this would be great with a Partagas. You know? I'm glad that you mentioned both those brands alongside what we're smoking because I very much agree. And the thing I like about this, it's very balanced. It's not aggressively sweet and like fruit notes. You get a little bit of oak from the barrel, yes. which I think with kind of the earthy, woody notes that you get in this JL, it works nicely. It works really well. I get the oaky on uh, the oak on a finish at this arm and neck yeah, for me. And it's just a touch because I hate really heavily oh. oaked anything. It's just a touch, which works perfectly. How much is this? So you said you thought it been probably around 70? No, he said that, I'm and I hoping it's 70. Around. I'm hoping it's like 55. 60, 59.99. Okay. Great. So that's the same, very similar price to- uh, That's a great price. Heinz Rare. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a, yeah. A lot of the VSOPs yeah. that we've been enjoying. Mm. Wow. I think that this is something that, uh, that I'm certainly going to start. I, I think, first off, no doubt, I think we should go down an Armagnac track here on the pod because i think this is a very interesting pairing with cigars yeah and i think that that's something that for me i i think when a lot of people talk about cognac brandy they're talking about after dinner after a meal maybe mm -hmm. our context is with the cigar that we're smoking right? right and i think that that perspective i think it's a little bit different of a lens into what this the the spirit brings or takes away even I sometimes com i completely agree. with the cigar yeah. and it i is. think that what i like about this finish is it's just enough. Mm -hmm. It doesn't linger too long, but it's not weak and short and just that yeah. it's just gone. This is perfect. Pretty accurate. I, mean, I agree. And, yeah. and the price point I think really matters here. And I say that because when you think of cognac, an XO that's got like 10 years plus age. That starts at like a hundred. The cheapest you'd oh, ever find one is one fifty. But like when out. we did Remy XO, Remy XO is two hundred a bottle. Outrageous. Yeah. Which is a, it's a wonderful spirit. It is. But I mean, how how many like bottles have how many bottles of each of us purchased after right. that podcast? And we gave it tens. Right. <laughs> I haven't purchased one. No. Right. It's, it's not, not something you would drink every day. Yeah. The That's a celebration. What's drink. interesting about this bottle too? So if you pull out a bottle of Remy, regardless of where it's the, the class of the bottle, people know it. Not many people know what Armagnac is. That's right. And if you pull out a really good bottle of Armagnac, it's it kind of I was a little skeptical because I never I've never really had an Armagnac once, maybe 10 years ago. You don't know what that spirit's going to be like and it's impressive when it performs beautifully in a in a party setting. I think it makes an imprint on a group. I really like that $60 price point, man. Oh, it's it's awesome. It's great. I think that's perfect. Awesome. Mm. Wonderful pairing. Well done, boys. All right, so far so good. Nice find. Yeah. I think we should dive into this a little harder. Agreed. For you sure. Know, now here's the question I have: Is it so? This is an XO at sixty bucks. I wonder what the 
<laughs> the lower tiers of Armagnac. Well, can we go higher? Tier? I don't. I don't the, the, no, no. The good Let's thing not go is down. Let's just go up. I don't think <laughs> they start out at XO, I believe. Yeah, I don't think there's that many that are lower than that. This usually is kind of the base level, and it's because Armagnac is meant to be a bolder spirit. So it's like you know, if you have Remy VSOP, that's it's a little thin. You can drink yep. that in volume. Remy XO is really rich and concentrated, and that is meant to be one part of the portfolio of cognacs. Where for Armagnac, they're all meant to be bold, so yeah. they all need kind of a minimum base level of a lot of age to achieve that. Interesting. So when Senator was picking this up today, you seemed a little surprised that you had found it because I know Bam had referenced this. Is it something that you can find anywhere, or is this like? shocked that you walked into total wine today and found it so armagnac you can find anywhere but this particular bottle when bam had sent the photo the first place i looked at was total wine which i'm sure any listener who's in the united states that's probably the first place that you would look for something and at least for our local total wines they they didn't have it so i thought there was no way i was going to find it anywhere near us and i just happened to stumble into bottle king and there it was on the shelf wow, wow. how many bottles were on the shelf Probably like four more. I'm gonna go. This. I'm, I'm gonna try to get one. <laughs> yeah, no, you might. As well. I am. I am. Get me one. Yeah, I will. Seriously, I will. Yeah, I I'm will. in. This is really good. It's good. It's unusual, right? It's different. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm. And and again, I have to again look at it through the lens of of what we do here. And this is a perfect spirit to pair with a cigar. Yeah. So how is it different than a cognac? I think what what Senator said it has that no 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 I mean like notes wise like like it has a touch a touch uh, of the woody thing at the at the end there's a, just a touch of that I think the viscosity is it's a little really different. interesting yeah um, and I I think the way that it's playing with the cigar flavor wise on the palate I just I think it's working really well yeah and on the notes the notes are not very different and they, they shouldn't be it's the mm -hmm. same stuff I right. mean. That Uni Blanc grape is present here just with some others that impart some slightly different flavors, mm -hmm. but the flavor profile is generally very similar. Yeah. It's just the the delivery is a it, little bit different. It is a and, bit bolder. Yes. And dare I say it's just a touch com more complex yeah. than I'm not sure most of the cognacs that we've had, not all, but most. Um, so I think that's where the distinguishing factors are. I yeah, think. but if I just picked up this glass, I would think it's cognac. I agree. That's, yeah, right. that's true. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's right. It'd yeah. be virtually indistinguishable in fact, if it was black. And, yeah. and to Senator's point, to get a ten-year age spirit for sixty bucks, dude, that tastes like this. Oh, it's, it's a home run. I mean, how many fifteen-year oh, yeah. age scotches have we had that are twenty dollars <laughs> more than this that are thin and really kind of undrinkable yeah. and yeah. uninteresting and uninteresting? Yeah. I mean, essentially, it's a cognac. Just in a different region because in France that's how they, yeah, you yeah, know, that's, that's how why they, they do say it. poor man's cognac. I mean, truly, the same way if I put a gla two glasses of champagne or sparkling in front of you and you tried them and said which one's from the champagne region and which one's from another region in France, no one outside of a master psalm would be able to tell the difference, right. That's when, yeah, this sit, is great. that's when we sit centered down at that uh, table. <laughs> <laughs> I would try to make you guys proud. We'll test his prowess. <laughs> <laughs> so, boys, we're about halfway through here on the Juan Lopez Selección number two. What are we thinking? Bro, the retrohale, you've got to constantly retrohale this to capture. I'm still getting a touch of sweetness and fruit on that retro, and it has not gone away. I think the whole delivery is smooth from... Yeah, but it's still, to where it's, it, is now. it still has that earthy, woody yeah, notes that continue to get. Yeah, which I like. Continue to yeah, get. yeah. I, think, uh, I think for me, I think the second third has been better than the first third. I mm. think it's kind of settled in a little bit. Makes sense. I think the spirit is it's working really well with that, as I've said three to three or four times already. I can't get over it. Um, but I'm really enjoying this cigar right now, and I wish I had a few mm -hmm. that I could I could kind of reach for every once in a while what i like is after taking a sip of the armagnac and then taking a draw and retro hailing that whole flavor experience is really quite nice because i'll trade you some of these for the silver jubilees <laughs> <laughs> he has silver jubilees damn it <laughs> don't tell anyone what the heck <laughs> Ro uh, rooster's referencing a uh, bolivar yeah uh, regional edition mm -hmm. hong kong silver jubilee hong yep. kong? i yeah. think it was hong kong yeah so speaking of regional editions, um, that's the one thing that Juan Lopez is actually kind of used by Habanos. Very similar to La Gloria Cubana uh, and some of the other, you know, tertiary brands. 
they use this marca a lot for regional cigars. I mean, I'm I'm looking at Cuban Cigar website. I, I mean, there must be 20, 25 cigars that have under JL one under no, just under Juan Lopez. Oh, oh I'm that, sorry, under, under Juan Lopez. Yeah, sure. under Juan Lopez. All that, regional cigars. That's just regional cigars. They use this constantly as a marker for uh for for regional cigars and i think you know i think that's because it's respected a little bit more than some of the other brands that you know that are kind of lower on the portfolio i have to interrupt you yeah so i like what senator just did because at the party i put i did put one chip of ice in this armagnac and it it went down so beautifully <laughs> It's a good move. So I just not a I, bad move. I was very curious. So the, the reason I did this, and, and this is why the price point of, of Armagnac is very fun, because if this were an XO cognac at two hundred a bottle, there's no way I'm putting any ice or water period in it. But at sixty bucks a bottle, I just put a few drops of water, and I just want to see what this is like if it opens up at all, and maybe some new flavor notes come about. But um, yeah, it's we'll a good see. move. Interesting. I have a question about regionals in general. Yeah, and maybe for the listener, I think this is a decent topic. I wasn't aware that Habano selects certain marcas to put out regionals. Yeah. Honestly, I thought every marca had a regional. No, the global brands don't. Okay. So, you know, I think maybe there's a few exceptions, but, you know, the global brands, Cohiba, So they, they Upman, consciously select some specific markers to create those regionals and then distribute them worldwide. Exactly. So, okay. you know, regionals that are respected, though. And right? why do they do that? Because what they do is they want to reward either dis uh, distributors specific regions like mm. Caidorce is very French driven. Yeah. Um, you know, they use a lot of those tertiary brands that don't have much regular production that's in the supply chain. Mm -hmm. They use those markers to I see. to feed, you know, it's almost like a reward, I guess, you know, yeah. celebrating 50 years, 25 years, 30 years, whatever it is. Um, and the brands that they use are El Rey del Mundo, Diplomaticos, Juan Lopez, which we're smoking tonight, Gloria Cubana, Por La Arañaga, uh, San Cristobal de la Habana has a lot of regional editions, and it's but also, I feel like this one has more than a lot. It's wow. also because of you know each region, like the flavor profile mm -hmm. for that region might sure. be different, so they kind of zero into that flavor profile of that region to create. Yeah, and are they selecting markas that have a shorter standard production line? Well, I think to, that's to, to to do two things. Of course, to fill out their production, but also to maybe proliferate their name. I think so. And I think that the reason why they don't, I'll, I'll kind of answer your question mm. the opposite way that you asked it, is like Cohiba, Upman, Partagas, you know, Hoyo, those cigars are so popular and are so mass produced. That they also have huge catalogs. They have huge catalogs, but it, they don't want to introduce a cigar that's going to be a one-off unless it's a, it's an EL, mm. which is those, those are the, oh, that happens. you know, those yeah, yeah, are the yeah. markers that, yeah. that get ELs. But I think, you know, it is interesting to see Juan Lopez have 20 or 25 hmm. regional editions that have been re released, I guess, since Habano started doing that, what, 20 years ago, That's 15, cool. 20 years ago. Cool. Um, and they only have two regular production cigars. So clearly this is a, a market that's existing hmm. to serve that purpose. You know? well, what's the verdict on that drink? Yeah, how did, how did the uh, adding so a little I have uh, to say, adding ice? a few drops of water opens this up really really nicely if you have a, like there's a bottle of water there just, garçon just i need put, a refill <laughs> just put a few drops i'm serious it, it it just with a few drops of water i think bam was mentioning before some of these like honey and kind of sweeter notes it brings some of that out and it it kind of rounds this out where i think the finish gets creamier the finish really? to me before was very bold, very whiskey like so, i wouldn't describe as creamy but with a little water to open it up it gets i will admit at the party, I did have a chip of ice in every drink and every refill of this Armagnac, and it was really, really very good. Yeah, I think yeah. it works really well. All right, so let's try this thing with a little water in it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It is really nice. I don't I don't notice like a monumental difference. I'm telling you, I do. I mean, I, 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 I want to second your thoughts, Senator. It is creamier. And the honey comes out. It opens up. It does. It does. I think I might need a little more cognac just to offset that. <laughs> Even with the Bam Bam pour? By the way, for listeners, Bam I'm poured a, a, a four fingers. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> so, you know, the uh, going back to the regional editions for a second of this marker specifically, people love 
the Juan Lopez regional editions. People chase them. You know, and I think Bolivar probably and Ramon maybe are the kind of the the mm. top tier regional editions that come out as far as what people chase. But Juan is right below that, you know. I have to say, you all of you are probably more attuned to the regionals and the ELs. I'm standard production guy all the way. You know, I don't know enough about it. I Same think, here. I think, I, honestly, Rooster, I think Rooster chased it more than more than most of us, mm. ELs and regionals. But for me... yeah. Yeah, for me, it's like I'm kind of over it at this point. Yeah, but I think uh, there's merit to what you just said. I mean, just stick to the regular brands because it's standard hit, production. It's, yeah. it's hit or miss. You've heard it's me really say this for miss. the longest time. I yeah. mean, for me, common sense is kind of what guided me in thinking this. That didn't mean I was right or wrong. It was just my assumption. And, you know, after Rooster procuring a lot and some other guys, I think it validated it. For me, it's very simple. If regionals were so great, they'd become part of the standard production line. Anything that is worth your time, they're going to continue to make. It's not just going to be dropped once and you're never going to see it again. You know, we laugh even in, in New World stuff like Davidoff has this limited edition and then they bring it back like five years later because it was so damn good. They and need to bring it back. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's like that with anything. Anything that's that great, they will truly make again. And so I just have a hard time believing that like these very limited and and even that is kind of bullshit. Like we've learned this with ELs, like that Ramon Ionis, the green box, obviously we gave it a 10. Thank God I just let it sit and age really helped it. But they made that sound like it was so limited and exclusive and boxes, you know, six months after they had all supposedly sold out were just popping up left and right and they were pumping more out. So for me, it's just like the standard production stuff is is has staying power for a reason. You wouldn't keep producing D4s decade after decade if that cigar wasn't so good that people are going to want to pursue it in perpetuity. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's not the case with regionals or ELs. Yeah. 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 But I, I mean, for me, it was kind of a journey, right? Like, yeah, I just wanted to try them. Yeah, sure. So I had the opportunity to to find them and try them. And now you're like, well, you know what? It's... It's great, but it's really not worth pursuing a lot of regionals. But all the some regionals are better than others. Uh, sure. is, are they more expensive than the standard production? They Typically, are. They, oh, are. Yeah. they are. Way and more now, than usually are. I mean, now oh, it's like now. Now, the, now the dollar amount on it is so prohibitive for me, and so, I think for Rooster too. I think you know it's it's just like it's it's gotten to the point now where you know obviously we've been to Cuba, right? We've all been to Cuba together, and we've seen how the process works. We've met these people. And it's like, it's the same tobacco, man. You're paying for an extra band. Mm -hmm. You're paying for a collaborative blending process that they're doing with these regional distributors and the a nicer and retailers. Box. A yeah, nicer yeah. box. Yeah. And now they're double or tripling the price. And it's, it's like, marketing. it's all the same there, tobacco. I think, I think you're yeah. right. You, you did take a, you, you took a risk for a while in pursuing those. And we shared a few with you. They were, some of them were excellent, but it is a risk. Not yeah. not, but none better than the best standard production. You know what? Yeah. This is true. And, and that's also, the thing. you know, go back to this whole conversation about the artisanal quality of cigars. Yeah, it's all the same tobacco, but we can all distinguish a RAS from a D4, sure. from a Schwa Supreme, and that's where the magic occurs, all right. in the standard production line. It's incredible. I mean, give me a punch punch from a 50 cab with some age on and it. And you'll know it. Yeah. And uh, yeah. there's nothing better. And it, to me, for the listener, if, if you're... If you have money burning a hole in your pocket and you want to buy something special, buy aged regular production cigars. That's that's where the magic is. Oh, totally. It's not in young regionals or even aged regionals, which mm -hmm. or ELs, which are just and bonko bucks. I would also say, I think a few years ago, Giz and I disagreed on this. If I'm willing to go down the rabbit hole of regionals or ELs, I think limitadas are way better than regionals interesting they way are. better i agree yeah i th i think that I, I i agree with you certainly now but i think there's been a lot of uh limitadas C that are yeah. certain els that have been really disappointing oh for sure really i don't mean they're bad. all good yeah. i just mean like the best els wipe the floor with the best regionals i think the partagas el the ramon Ionis el oh yeah they're both fantastic yeah yeah and i just i think that it you know if i'm looking to get something special it's going to be something with 10 to 15 years of age on it from mm -hmm. a regular production, maybe a cigar that I don't have a ton of, but it's going to be a regular production cigar that I can actually appreciate and pull out and want to smoke. Not Are you, are you something kidding that, me? You know, a 10-year-old standard production cigar? Yeah, 15. 15? That is 
extraordinary. Those are extraordinary cigars. Well, like a punch punch box that I, you know, got like uh, I saw got that. a cab recently. 2011s or 14s? No, 2014. 14s, so that's a yeah. 50 cab. And it's about thirty dollars a stick. Okay, I was supposed to get so a few. regular punch. <laughs> <laughs> Go back to high school. <laughs> <laughs> I'll show you my diploma. <laughs> <laughs> you know, my stepdaughter just graduated. Bam. Ooh, she loves cigars. Nice. I'll send you. I'll send some La Puntas your way. <laughs> She loves ELs. Yeah, ELs. Oh, sure. <laughs> Aged ELs. <laughs> no, but Sir I, Winston's I, her favorite. Oh, yeah. Big, yeah. Big, and 898s. There you go. But no, D- Rooster, you're right. I mean, it's like, <laughs> y- you know, y- you get something with age in a, you know, you love Punch Punch and you love Punch Punch with age. That's, yeah. that's the way to go. I mean, a regular Punch Punch is about, what, 20 bucks? And it, you know, even if it's only got a year or two of age, they smoke beautifully young. They do. In my yeah. opinion. Yeah. I they love do. that cigar. Yeah. So there's been a lot of rumbling boys of uh, foreign interference, let's say, in Cuba, namely uh, Chinese, which obviously we've talked about a lot specific to cigars. But it's also, also in the news. It's in the news it a lot. It's in the news. Yeah. yeah, but let's, you know, we'll go bird's eye mm-hmm. uh, bigger than cigars, but it seems like China and Russia are really, really moving into Cuba. Well, that's what's funny. It's like, you know, we took this trip to Cuba and I feel like for so many years, Cuba's kind of been treated as this completely irrelevant country geopolitically. And I think what's been kind of shocking and even alarming now uh, with us going there and having some local conversations and then what you now see in the news, it's like, I actually think years from now, Cuba is going to be like hugely important geopolitically in the world, which is crazy to think. Yeah, yeah. Because it has not. Little island. Just been this little island that sat there that has been isolated from the rest of the world that nobody has ever taken seriously as ever being of importance in any sort of geopolitical conflict. And now, you know, China, obviously, there's a lot of investment in Cuba. Yeah. We know they've you know bought part of Habanos. They want to buy it all. Right. We we heard heard that in March. Yeah. They want to buy... 100% 100% of Habanos. I have to say, here's my limited opinion on geopolitics or what spurs it on. Honestly, when China made their three billion, was it three billion into Habanos SA? Three or five? I, I don't know what the number was. It's a massive multi-billion dollar number. I think that that was an eye-opening occurrence. You'd have to think that's one of the main reasons why China's now so heavily embedded. I know they've been there for a long time, but now that it's in the news, it's interesting timing. And now that Russia's coming in. Well, the spy base thing even is crazy. Thing. It's yeah. like, so yeah. the funny thing is like, there's this, and, and this is like the problem with the media, right? It doesn't matter what outlet we're talking about. Like the amount of shit that the media gets wrong is just beyond frustrating. All the big American newspapers are reporting that uh, China and Cuba have reached an agreement and China's going to build a spy base. And then you had the American government come out saying they built a spy base back in 2019. That's existed. They already knew about mm-hmm. that. They're now looking to expand the capabilities of this, basically. Wow. And you think of how close Cuba 90 miles, is. baby. 90 miles, right? We all remember Elian Gonzalez floating <laughs> over from Cuba <laughs> to Florida. I mean, yeah. that's how close it is. Oh yeah. You can literally just be on a piece of driftwood and float to America. That's how close we're talking Avoid about. Avoid those sharks. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like you think about that proximity and then China increasing this capability to be able to spy on the U.S., yeah. I mean, that's scary stuff. And, and I think Russia's feeling left out. They've got a little bit of FOMO, and that's why they're coming back. Well, I think Russia sees opportunity, yeah. whether they have FOMO this or is not. True too. It's like you you look at, you know, we've obviously had this embargo for decades. No matter what you think about the embargo, and I won't be political at all in saying this, it hasn't worked in the sense that nothing has changed in Cuba, right? Yeah. Like the goal was to force some sort of change. Mm-hmm. Cuba's the same now as it was decades ago. Oh, yeah. And so then you had obviously Argu- the Obama, arguably worse, arguably worse. Yeah. And so then you had the Obama administration try to open things up a bit and say, well, if it, it hasn't worked for all these decades, we shouldn't be doing the same thing. That'd be insanity. Let's just try something else. And then you had the Trump administration close everything back off. And what that's done, whether you agree or disagree with it, like what's clear now is because the U.S. is shut off from Cuba yet again, 
there's a huge opportunity in vacuum for China and Russia to just kind of have carte blanche there and do and what they want. Totally they are fucking agree with what he just said. They I are think desperate. Obama, look, I'm not, I'm not going to make a political sp- statement, but what Obama did should have been expanded. Right. Because what, what would we would still we would be there? Would have a bigger footprint, better control, better ties and relationships. What you just said, Senator, is spot on. It's the reason why these other countries are not coming in. Because because don't forget, let, let's look at the Cuban side of it. They're clearly so desperate for foreign money. Oh yeah, and they'll They're take the first comer. For, sure. Of course. So if the, they of if they could have the United States money, that's what they would want. Every tourist when 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 we are there and they say, "Where are you from? Where are you from?" You know, you're walking around the Parque Central over by the Floridita. Every person that's outside there's saying, "Are you American? Are you American?" Oh yeah, we're American. Oh, we love Obama. We wish you know, we wish it was like it was. Ugh. We wish it was like it was. What a colossal and mistake. And they have no it's not a political thing. It's just their lives were different. Of course. And right. they are desperate for foreign currency. Yeah. And but it's a shame. you know, China coming in didn't change anything for the local people. No. Right? Didn't make an impact. Probably got worse. It does take time though. Uh, it does take time. And now Russia coming in, yeah. I mean, I don't think the people are that you know, Impacted. emphatic about like Impacted, if yeah. it's going to really make a difference to their lives. Russia is going to come in. They're going to invest. They're doing it for investments. They're going to they're going to put up hotels and stuff. And the government's going to get rich, and the people will still stay the same. Of course. Yeah. Well, that's a, that's also you know, a that's, possibility. Yeah. Yeah. This is what I crazy. hope that changes. But of course, this is what's crazy to me. So when we were there in March, conversations we had with locals were very very much centered around China. I mean, we didn't actually hear a word about Russia when we were there in March. And obviously we've kept in touch with a lot of the folks that we've met there. And only more recently from some of these conversations that we still continue to have with friends that we have there, there's all of a sudden this Russian investment is like rampant all of a sudden in Cuba. And I couldn't believe, but now it's even being publicly reported. This is like way more robust than I thought. I thought like, okay, maybe hotels, they're buying up a few things. It's crazy. Like the Cuban government has basically formally agreed to let Russia do just about anything they want there. So here's some of the things that have been agreed to, and this is directly from the Russia's presidential commissioner speaking on behalf of Putin and the Cuban government saying what they've agreed to. So first, uh, they are allowing Russians to lease land for 30 years in Cuba. Wow. Which has not been done in God knows how long. You cannot lease, the government basically owns everything in Cuba. They're letting Russians come in and lease land to make any investment, a hotel, whatever it may be, for 30 years without any problem. They're allowing duty-free importation of agricultural machinery. They're allowing the right to repatriate profits in foreign currency, which the Cuban government currently restricts for anybody else. Every, you, you can't make money in Cuba and then you know oh take it back God, in your local currency. Huge, that, that's not a thing. That alone is a massive move. And then the other crazy thing uh, the Cuban government has also greenlighted Russian banks to open subsidiaries to finance wow. Russia businesses on the island. Unbelievable. There'll be Russian banks in Cuba. Wow. 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 So now, Can't wait for Russian tobacco. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Here's gonna my, the, it's going to be called the Putin blend. <laughs> Here's my question now. If you're the United States, it's like, you, how, do you, how do you undo this? Right? You Forget can. the political nature. Let's again. We've all said it. We're not a political show. Let's take that out of it. United States. Period. How do you undo this happening ninety miles from the coast without either matching or beating? It's awful. This intense investment and and agreement to fund Cuba. Yeah. The other thing I forgot to mention it? quickly before answering the the difficult question you just posed. Uh, So Russia's airline Aeroflot, they formally resume regular flights to Cuba as of July 1st. Wow. Wow. So that will bring in enormous tourist money from Russia. Which they had. You know, there were a lot of Russian tourism. You know, there was a lot of Eastern European tourism there. But they'd have to fly in unusual routes to get there. I think it was direct, but I think that was pre-COVID. Is that right? And then the war, obviously, with Ukraine, that changed a lot, too. But having Russia come in, that would probably keep the U.S. out even more. That's the problem. Brewster is exactly right. I mean, the the tensions with China, right, they're they're economic ones. They're not uh, anything more than that at this Mm -hmm. point. And even all the Chinese investment and even this base that's existed since 2019, nothing's posed like a, a direct or serious threat. But the problem with now formally making all of these concessions to Russian investment there, 
I mean, Russia's in a war with <laughs> Ukraine that the United States obviously has very firmly supported Ukraine and its sovereignty. How do you possibly navigate this now? I mean, there's no universe in which the United States can no. meaningfully do anything there. It's a there. complete undermining of what the U.S. would have hoped. And I think, I mean, it's it's really like, you know, Russia and China have put the United States in a really, really interesting yeah. position with, with regard to Cuba, an, an, an island which in the 50s, the United States loved Sure they did. You know, of obviously before did. everything happened. Yeah. And now, what, going on 60 years later, it's like, it seems totally lost. You know, from the point of view, like, I'm, you know, a lot of what I do from the point of view of everyday work, real estate and investment and development, that is a massive loss of opportunity. Just from that perspective. Put, put aside the, the geopolitical issues, which I'm not clearly as versed as some of you are. Because of it being so close to the United States, how the relationship hasn't been fixed over so long. It's, it's just absurd. It's, it's, it's awful. The, and the piece of it that bums me out, and, and this is, a, I guess, a, uh, an assumption, but I feel like the Chinese and the Russians are not as interested in, in the humanitarian piece wow. of it Thank you. than I think most mm -hmm. Americans would be. Yeah, like, let's, let's be real. The, the way that Americans are legally able to travel to Cuba like we did, one of those boxes that, that you can check that we all did mm -hmm. is in support of the Cuban people. Right. I guarantee you that there is no one getting on an Aeroflight flight, uh, flight from Russia that is going <laughs> in support of the Cuban people. No. no. They're going to buy things and spend money That's right. and get out. And, and go, go to home. the beach. Yeah. And you, you know, we all hope, just from the perspective of where we are, we love the Cuban culture. We love, we've been there multiple times, Cuban people, and of course, the cigars we live for. You just hope that the citizens there, their lifestyles are improved. You really hope for that. And it doesn't look like it. I mean, you, you see all these hotels going up. It's still early. You're, you're walk, but, but you're yeah. walking around and you, you, know, you, you hear about Russians building banks and hotels. Mm. That's not boiling down to fixing the infrastructure. I mean, yeah. bam, yeah. you were like stressing walking around seeing these I, construction projects that very locals stressful. were putting together with true. two by fours. That's right. You know, right. it's like, it's, it's not... You know, you see one area of, of Havana. But here's one thing. Cranes Just and, and it, towers. Yeah, so when you build a building that big, and if you're building multiple structures that are over 10, 20 stories, there has to be some infrastructure to support that building that has to be improved. You can't build it on existing infrastructure. So they're going to make some, just by way of the nature of the development, they have to make some improvements. But does that percolate out to every residential dwelling? That's the question. Highly unlikely. Yeah. The whole thing's just wild to me because I, I think for the longest time, people always ask the question, do you think at some point the embargo will be lifted? And my opinion has been uh, uh, at some point, sure, it's got to be, right? Cuba needs the investment. They need the help. That country cannot sustain in the way it is right now in perpetuity. And it would make a whole lot of sense given how close they are to us and how we would want to obviously protect against any sort of geopolitical threat that eventually we'd find some way to open certain things up and improve the lives of Cubans there and also enhance our national security here. And that was my mindset all along, even with this whole China spy base, all of that. There are still so many ways in which I think that would have worked. What's crazy to me now, though, with this Russian piece, it's very, very new. I mean, again, in March, no one we spoke to there said a word about Russia. Yep. And it's only very recent. And now I'm sitting here saying I, the embargo may never be lifted. Because of this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, would the U.S. ever lift the embargo with Cuba? Because, I mean, it's a communist country. Yeah, but, you I know, mean, having said that, listen, the strategy is kind of outdated. It, oh, absolutely. That embargo yes. hasn't helped at all. It hasn't influenced their behavior. It hasn't changed anything. Uh, you know, the U.S. has been trying to export capitalism all throughout the world, in the Middle East, everywhere. And they're not doing it in the, you know, in the backyard. And but with Russia, you know, they have to change with the Russia way they think about. With Russia coming in, it makes it worse. Well, here's a question well, for, for you. U.S. Of here's course it does. Amateur geopolitical guy. Let's say the U.S. lifted the embargo. It won't help the powers that be in Cuba, but could that help the average mom and pop that may want to go to the U.S. earn a better living? Maybe their kids stay in Cuba or vice versa. It just creates more freedom of travel. Wouldn't that help the, the, the average family? 
I think it did in 2014. I think it could possibly. You know, I, I, I think we've seen that. I yeah. think it could, but to me, the know. bigger problem, I'm less concerned about um, any embargo enabling freer travel to the United States because we could never take in every Cuban resident. This is that's true. Not a thing. Of course, that's true. So for me, it's like, you know, what impact does the embargo have on the ability of people there to have access to basic necessities, to have more opportunities to earn income? And for there to be like more American investment that I would think, I tend to think would, you know, provide a bit more opportunity than some other investment that's happened there that could care less what these people yeah. make. And sure. happening the, now. The, yeah. tra- right. the trade would increase, so maybe, the tourism maybe would that's, increase. Maybe that's the approach. Yeah, and it, yeah, it the is and it isn't though, but that that's what becomes hard then. It, it's like, you know, once now Pandora's box has been opened with all this Russian investment, it's like, you know, how much is there going to, I mean, I just read off, they're giving 30 year leases to Russian entities that invest in Cuba. They're waiving all of these different things. I mean, it's created such an incredible climate for any Russian entity to want to invest there. Us lifting the embargo doesn't mean that those things are extended to Americans who invest there. That's true, of course. And so we still have no meaningful incentive or way to really invest in a serious way there. And so- What's sad to me is, you know, I, I don't know that it would do a whole lot at, at right now, given what's going on. I think it requires a conversation with the powers that be in Cuba. And Senator. And Senator. <laughs> <laughs> you know, plus, don't forget, there's a mass exodus of young people out of Cuba. Yeah. yeah. That's happening. Major every, brain yeah. drain. Yeah. yeah. But the interesting thing is they could turn it around very quickly. But how do you keep, keep the, them? How do you keep You have them to there? improve opportunity. Yeah, opportunity, opportunity and, the, and the level of living, really, the lifestyle and every access person, to jobs. Every person that we spoke to in Cuba that had some frustration about their life and the government or whatever the case may be, it all boiled down to opportunity. Yeah. Not yeah. being able to access bare necessities that people need to survive there. Yeah. And they're not looking for like, they're not looking for designer bags. They're not even looking for premium cigars no. that are made no, in no, Cuba. No, no, no. They don't want they the cigars. Want, they want what they need. Yep. They yes. need food and shelter. Remember, That's it. remember the conversation that we had with someone whose sister was a doctor. Yeah. She makes more money as a short order cook than as a doc- as a as a doctor, yeah. a practicing medical professional. Yeah, it, it is scary to see. You know, it, obviously, what we do here. I'm curious about the impact on on us, but now having connections and friends in Cuba. It's like, man, I, you know, you just want their situation, their lives, their the possibilities to be better, right? And it seems like it, 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 it's moving further away than than closer, and that's a real tragedy. Given, I mean, Cubans have access to the internet, yeah, as they have access they to information. Yeah. They're not tied off the way that they used to be. That's true, and it's a real tragedy that they could see the possibilities. It's just those possibilities are not appearing at the, uh, at their doorstep that they can you know make something better for their yeah. families because right. you know at the end of the day it's sad like we talk about all this investment and a lot of it's going to be in real estate and in development and things mm. like that like bam's talking about you know all of those things here we invest all this money in infrastructure in building hotels and hospitality all these things we these are jobs that pay people living wages yeah right people that construct these buildings in america make money that sure. they can support their families sure. with. Sure. And the problem is with the current structure in Cuba, no. it doesn't matter what's being built or put up, they're not making a living wage doing that work. They are not. And you, what you said earlier, their ability to repatriate their profits back to their current currency, they're not going to keep any money in any Cuba. Any money in Cuba. That's right. There's no incentive for it. That's right. I want, I want to maximize my project. I'm taking every dollar out of it. And there's a, a asset there that I'll continue to make money on for 30 years because of my lease. That's right. So it's crazy. Well, Cuban government will get its payday. Oh, sure. You yeah. better believe it. They'll get their cut. Sure. Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's an unfortunate thing, guys. And it seems like it's only going to keep ramping up because the island is, I mean, it's its ripe for opportunity and development. I mean, it it's... It's kind of like an undeveloped opportunity for these countries. I mean, so when we visited the several times that we've been there, we've never made an attempt to go to the beach or the shoreline. Yeah. I've been watching a lot of Europeans and South Africans that are going there and have got their own little podcasts and their own, yeah, you know, Canadians. And I watched these clips there. The shoreline is incredible. Yeah. They love it. And completely undeveloped. 
Yeah, it's unspoiled. Uh, absolutely. It's amazing. That's going to change now. So you hope, you hope for the best. Yeah. You can, you, that's all you can do. I mean, as a U.S. citizen, you cannot stay at any hotels. No. No. Yeah. And I don't think that'll yeah. change. Which is, a, I think, is actually a beautiful thing. In that you you know and you go works. there and, and you're yeah. putting money in the pockets of, of love Cuban the, people. Love the Airbnb. That's a model. beautiful thing. Yeah, it's I'm, true. I'm I'm almost glad that we can't stay at hotels because <laughs> we've made some incredible relationships and, and and had wonderful experiences with Cuban people there because of that. You know, Ivan, and, my man. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? At least under Obama, there was some banking. There was people. Yeah. You know, U.S. citizens could use credit cards and they didn't have to rely on cash like when we go there we have to take yeah cash take a lot of cash it opened up all right boys so we're coming to the end of the juan lopez selection number two what do you guys think of the cigar what do you think of it you're you put yours down you're done i'm done i just wrapped it up i thought the la- i thought the middle the middle third was probably the best the last third got a little iffy for me. You know what? It got flat for me the last, I guess, inch of the yeah. cigar. Yeah. yeah, the last third got a little iffy. Not awful, but it just flattened out. Yeah. Yeah. How about you, Rooster? Yeah, same. I mean, to me, like on the light, I really enjoyed the cigar. You know, like the first few puffs were really delicious. The smoke out of the out of the foot was amazing. Um, in the middle, it was good. But yeah, you're right. On the last third, it's it is kind of flat, you know. But it overall, I mean, this is a cigar that will never score a very high uh, well, don't, score. Well, don't count it. I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> we're not there yet. But I'm just saying, I mean, it's, I think the JL1 to me, it's it kind of edges. Yeah, yeah. Edges I agree with JL2. I agree. What do you guys think? I think I agree with Gizmo. The, the second third was the most enjoyable, uh, probably the only third that I was enjoying what I was getting. The first third, I mentioned that the dominant, earthy, Woody notes, not that there's anything wrong with it, just for my flavor profile, not really what I pursue. Uh, the second third got a little sweeter. I got a little bit more of the fruit notes that I was initially getting on the burn line, but not getting uh, with each draw. So I did enjoy that. And then, yeah, the final third, um, I'm not really sure what I'm getting right now. It's like yeah. totally fizzled out. I mean, to, what's so if you smoke one out of like a little bit more aged box, it's a different experience. I'm sure it is. Yeah. I have you, to say. And you would know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what about you, Picardo? Yeah, for me, I don't think uh, the changes were that, uh, you know, um, I don't know what the right word for it is, but prominent, I don't know, maybe one, one of the words. I thought it was reasonably very consistent in a very soft flavor profile for me and it's just like a regular cigar good smoke out but but nothing really which really engaged me into it Mm. and felt that hey this is fantastic yeah for you not extraordinarily memorable no yeah well that i i I actually very much agree with what pagoda's saying i mean that's part of my challenge like i found myself really sipping a lot of this armagnac hoping that it, like that was helping this cigar all the way through. I totally this, agree. Like this is without true. it, I'll it's be true. honest. If I had nothing, no spirit paired with this, I would have a hard time with this cigar. So I started the cigar <laughs> just drinking my seltzer, like I always do. Yes, we know. And <laughs> the the Armagnac helped a lot. It helped quite a bit. Uh, the weird thing is the combination kind of worked. It I, did. Yeah, it did. No, it did. I think this Armagnac really kind of. We talked about the earthiness. That 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 nature of the cigar really paired well with this uh, with the spirit. So you could put that army neck in IV for me right now. <laughs> I enjoy we can it. make that happen. By yes, the way. I know you can. <laughs> All right, boys, you ready to do the formal liquor rating on the Dartingalong? <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> uh, Dartingalong, Dartingalong. I think that's close. Dartingalong Armagnac XO. We're going to have to send a photograph of that label to all the listeners because we've just butchered the name. <laughs> <laughs> I'll figure it out by the time I record the intro. All right. Bam, I, bam, you're up. I'm between an eight and a nine on this thing. And I'm going to trend upward because I enjoyed it the first time and I, I'm continuing to love it. I'm giving it a nine. Okay. Pagoda. Yeah, a nine. Yeah, I think eight and a nine. I, I'd give it a nine because I, I'm definitely going to have it again. And for the price point, it's fantastic. For me, it's like... Uh, you know, I would just think of it as a cognac and just drink it. And yeah. It's, yeah. It's very, very nice. Senator. 
So I've also been going back and forth between an eight and a nine. I was initially skewing an eight, but what's now kind of made me lean more toward a nine, it is not easy to make a spirit that is this robust in flavor to be able to deliver it this smoothly. I mean, when we drank this neat without any water, ice, anything, it was still very enjoyable. Mm. Just a few drops of water brought out some other notes and enhanced it. It did. Uh, but I just think of like other, you know, spirit, like some scotches that are not light, but really rich and flavorful. Some of them can really pack a punch and it honestly cannot even be enjoyed neat. Uh, the same is certainly true with many bourbons. And so I just give them a lot of credit for being able to deliver this robust um, an amount of flavor in a really balanced way. It's not too sweet. It's not too oaky. Um, so for, and then the last thing I have to factor in, I mean, $60 oh, for a dude. spirit that's aged 10 years the price and delivers off this. The charts. It's, it's a nine. So I'm also at a nine. I was definitely, I've, I've been at a nine the whole way. The whole way I've been at a nine. Yeah. I, I, I wasn't wavering at all. Mm. And once I heard the price point, it like solidified it for me. Nice. Like, I, I think this is an excellent spirit, and uh, I'm definitely going to go out and buy it. Or Bam's going to buy a buy a I'm gonna go bottle tomorrow. for me. And, I'm going tomorrow. Yeah, please yeah, get me one. We're all, we're all graduating from high school. Yeah, you are. Us a bottle. <laughs> one, two, three, four bottles. You got it. Check. <laughs> I'll, t- I'll take a fundy. <laughs> <laughs> all right, boys. So the formal liquor rating is a flat 9.0. Excellent. excellent I think it's score. an excellent score for this. Yes. Very pleased. Bam. Uh, and this I do think good, listeners good should fight. be buying this. Thank you. I agree. The listeners well, should run just out. Just to check it out. I'm going to yeah. thank Lizard Charlie for giving me a glass of this. Thank you, Charlie. Excellent. Uh, yeah. Worth pursuing. Yeah. Good find. All right. So you guys ready to do the formal Lizard rating on the Juan Lopez Selección number two? Yeah. So, Rooster, for, you're up. For me, it's a solid eight. Okay. Hmm. Uh, for me, it's a seven. I thought the middle third was really good. I don't think it was great. And the first third and the last third, I thought were mediocre. Seven for sure. Senator. I'm between a six and a seven. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Brutal. Whoa. And <laughs> See, I, Whoa. Should, I should have brought the 2014. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I told you. <laughs> but this is my problem. It, it, it's like, you know, no matter how much age this has, its best is still not as good as an HD4 or an age rast or any Cuban Robusto that I really love. So that's, that's what I have a hard time with. Um, I think here I'm going to round up. And the reason I'm going to do that for my palate, I, I just don't love the Juan Lopez profile. And that's where this leans more toward a six, but why I'm willing to round up, I, I can see why for someone whose palate pursues more of these earthy, woody, dominant notes in the cigar. I like that very much in the background, not kind of the foreground. I can see why that someone would like and pursue it. So I don't want to suggest that, you know, this is categorically not an enjoyable cigar. I think there are things to like about it. Um, I will say it actually, at least construction-wise, performed very well. I was a little nervous early on. Bam mentioned some of the burn issues that these can have. Yeah. But it kind of settled in and burned very evenly. Nice, beautiful, uh, lighter ash than than most Cubans. Um, and the second third was enjoyable. It was just the the first and and certainly the final third that were were not that great. So for me, it's a it's a seven. If I and in this also, I've now definitely convinced myself rounding up was a good move here. If someone gave this to me and I had nothing else to smoke. Could I have this and have a decent experience? Yeah, Absolutely. Totally, totally I wouldn't fine. be upset. Yeah. It yeah. wouldn't be a bad experience. Absolutely. And, and that's a six. I, I probably wouldn't be so thrilled. So, you know, in a pinch, if I didn't have something else, sure, I'd smoke another. Would I pursue this, though? Definitely not. Pagoda. So I'm at a seven. And uh, the reason is that I could definitely smoke it if someone handed it to me. It's not something I'd pursue, but it's a recommend because. It is reasonably pleasant, and it's a very easy smoke. And, you know, pairing with, with the Armanac, it just worked well. I, uh, it was a very pleasant evening today, so I'll leave it at a seven. Nice. Okay, bam. So I gave the Juan Lopez number one a nine. That is, for me, an excellent cigar. It's in my regular rotation. 
The JL2, which we had tonight, it's always been, for me, I've liked it. It's always been a step or two down. So I am going to go with a seven. But it's, a, for me, a respectable, I think seven's a respectable score for this particular cigar. Seven for me. Okay. Former Lizard rating on the Juan Lopez Selección number two is a 7.2. You know, and the and the JL one got a seven 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 yeah. seven. Look at you, Bam. Yeah, well, it's a it's fair. I think the JL one. I think Bam been, went back into the archive. I, I did earlier today. <laughs> he, he he remembers when he wants to. He I, does. <laughs> <laughs> you mean I open up the internet once in a while? <laughs> That's think, exactly what it scored. Bam, honestly, was a the, seven, seven. the JL one should have been an eight and over, in my opinion. I gave that a nine. I, that's for me a fantastic Cuban. It really is. I yeah, think. but like I said, I mean Juan Lopez needs age. Mm, they do. So, yeah, you know that's I true. Mean, you you smoke a box that's a little bit older, and it will be a, like a high rate. I agree. Yeah, yeah. If so not I'm, a nine. I'm exactly. looking at I'm looking at other robustos. It's definitely from for a Cuban robusto. It's definitely on the lower end. Yeah, it's versus strange. a lot of the others, but um, I think that's also happened. It happens to be the fact that these don't come up on the market very often. They don't. One, and I, the JL one or two, you don't see them. And I think the flavor profile. I, I think the flavor I, they're profile. They're just not accessible. I think the flavor profile is also has an accessibility issue where yeah, it's, it's a very different. specific smoker. It's a polarizing flavor profile. You know, exactly. the, I really believe so, that he's right. You know, Senator's right. The woodiness and the earth notes. You don't. That's not a usual. Those aren't usual notes that you get in a Cuban, right? So it's but a little J different. But the JL1 has fruit and floral it, notes. Oh, big time. Yeah, big time. more and so than the JL2. That's more quintessential Cuban. Yeah. All right, boys. A great night. So on the <laughs> Dartigalong, <laughs> I got to figure out how to say that, man. Armagnac. It makes me laugh every fucking time. <laughs> Look, Gizmo, once you, once you master Spanish, you need to work on that. By the way, then French dude, is nice for you. I am so deep into Spanish right now on oh, yeah? Babel. It's awesome. What what you got? Oh, I I'm like, <laughs> don't test me now. I'm like 38 lessons in. Really? In really? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, really? I'm killing right. it. So yeah. how about how about you say in Spanish? I really liked this cigar. Oh boy. Me gusta la tabaco. Wow. Oh my lord! Look at you. Huh? Mucho. Wow. Wow. Huh? Me gusta so, esta. I think maybe next time we talk about Babel. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's prepping for his next Cuban trip is what he's doing. Exactly. My man. All right, so a 9.0 on the Dartiga Long Armagnac XO and a 7.2 for the Juan Lopez Selección number two Robusto tonight. An excellent night, boys. Sure, and just one last comment. I... I don't think Spanish is going to be help. It's going to be Chinese or Russian. <laughs> That's true. I should probably switch my uh, and, and my preferences. Ne next trip, we're going to be paying in rubles. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> All right, boys. A great night. We'll see you all next week. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks for joining us. You can find our merch store and ratings archive at our brand new website, loungelizardspod.com. That's loungelizardspod.com. Don't forget to leave us a rating and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. If you have any comments, questions, if you want to reach out, say hello, tell us what you're smoking, email us, hello at loungelizardspod.com. You can also find us on Instagram, at loungelizardspod. We really appreciate your time, and we'll, uh, we'll see you next week.